Again, as I said last Sunday, in this, uh, the 19th, we have a special congregational meeting, and we're going to open the time capsule next weekend. So if you are at all curious about the time capsule, please come and, and enjoy that um, opportunity with us. Session meeting is on the 21st at 7. Our Christmas Eve service is at 4 p.m. Just a straw poll because I'm new here. How many of you like having Christmas Eve early? Okay, so how many of you like having it later? Definitely early. Definitely early, no question about it. Okay, um, please don't forget our Christmas Eve service is at 7.30. It's a service of lessons and carols. We're going to be singing five hymns, and I need some readers, because I know you guys get tired of hearing me talk. So if you're interested in volunteering for that, that would be awesome. And we're going to sing again on the 26th. I understand that people feel like they've already been to church on Friday night. They might not want to come on Saturday or, the, or Sunday. They might be traveling, but, you know, we worship the Lord on Sundays. And the other thing that I know I need to talk about is this insert in our bulletin. Our, our artwork is awesome. Our special giving, our, our special offerings each year, um, there are four. You are in... A very small minority of churches that give to all four offerings. And the joy offering is to help church workers, not just pastors, Christian educators too, and other people, um, who, when they fall upon hard times, whether for health care reasons or for whatever reasons, this offering helps church workers. And I understand that Stuart. The guy who first preached for you when Dale left and who just preached the last, the 21st, just before I came, he is a direct beneficiary of this joy offering. And sometimes it helps people to know that their money isn't just going to some random thing, some other place that doesn't ever help you. But I want to encourage you to consider this part of your Christmas and your end giving because it does help people in our own community. Are there any other announcements? Lynn Ellen. Oh, golly, she just told me that, too. I, I, I'd be dangerous if I had a brain. I heard that Presbyterians like to eat. <laughs> Again. We're having a fellowship opportunity downstairs, and I'm assured that there's a ton of food downstairs. So please, after the worship service, come on down. Um, I want to just say one other thing. At the benediction... I want to cue you guys about singing this thing that we've been singing for three weeks today. That little, that little make up my heart a stable tune. Um, we're going to sing that just before Salad plays the Pup Slew, okay? So if you could be so kind, today we're going to be singing Love and we're going to flip it. Next Sunday we're going to be singing Joy, okay? I think that's the easiest way I can make it. Anything else? Ellen, Sandy, Linda? Doug. We are blessed to get bread from Jimmy John's practically every night, and otherwise I'd throw it in the dumpster. Uh, I did get some day old bread from them that would be great for croutons, for uh, uh, French onion soup, French onion soup <laughs> or, uh, making bread pudding, or all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in taking home a pack of Tim John's bread for any of those purposes or others that you might have in mind, let me know. I'll be glad to get you some. Christmas Eve dressing, hoagies in the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> any other announcements? Let's worship the Lord. <laughs>
So this family is going to light the Advent candles. So I would invite them up now. Good morning. Today we light the first, second, and third Advent candles. The first Advent candle represents hope. The second candle represents faith, and the third candle represents love. In this holy season, we celebrate that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. <laughs> Always be full of joy. I say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If you're able, please stand and join in our first hymn, 133, O Come All You Faithful.
ourselves into each other, the way is clear for a new beginning. Let us pray. Please join in the prayer of confession. O oh God, God, you search us out and know us, and all that we are is open to you. We confess that we have sinned. When we make no room for Christ and fail to welcome him into our lives, when we seek to cut down those who might rise above us, when we sing sweet sentiments over Christ's birth and fail to rejoice over his everyday presence, we turn to you, O oh Christ, and ask to cast out our sin and be born in our today. Beloved, Jesus Christ came to save the world, not to condemn it. He's the only one who could. And yet he stands at the throne of grace, the throne of mercy. Beloved, you have confessed, and in the blood of Jesus Christ you are all forgiven. Be at peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. Amen. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a woman named Elizabeth. She was also a cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's described as an old woman, but we really don't know how long people lived back in those days. So she really probably was younger than most of the moms of us in this pageant. giving an offering to the Lord one day, and an angel named Gabriel appeared to him and said that he and Elizabeth would soon be parents and that they were to name the baby John. John will grow up to be great in the sight of the Lord and bring joy and gladness to them, and many will rejoice because of him. Zachariah found this a bit hard to believe, since both he and his wife were old. <laughs> yeah. 
Just after this, God chose to send that same angel to Mary, who was only a teenager, and that angel announced that Mary was special and had no reason to be afraid, and that she was pregnant. You'd think that Mary was afraid and had wide eyes, red cheeks, and maybe forgot to breathe, but Mary responds basically, God is in control. Bring it on. Like most teenagers, Mary probably needed to talk with someone who wasn't a parent for a lot of reasons. She heads off to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth seems like the perfect listening ear for Mary, older and more like an aunt. Plus, her husband had met an angel, so Elizabeth would likely believe Mary. But Mary probably didn't expect the greeting she got, because Elizabeth basically started broadcasting the news to the whole village, shouting, Blessed is the child who you bear, and blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. This story wasn't exactly met with that enthusiasm when it was shared with Joseph and his parents. So again, an angel drops in and has some words to say. This child, the angel said, was going to be the hope of the nation. Here's your chance, Joseph. Love Mary as you should, or go down in history as the guy who didn't follow God's plans. And so it is that they began life together.
few months later, Joseph came home from work to a very expectant Mary. Then the news shows. The government requires them to make a 90-mile journey by donkey to register the taxes they owe to the occupying force. I doubt Joseph's response was, Come on, honey, let's go on a road trip. Mary had to be thinking, Seriously? A road trip on a donkey while pregnant? No way. The trip likely meant a missed paycheck or three, plus expenses that weren't in their budget. And the trip meant exposure to the elements, vulnerability of robbers, dealing with surge pricing from cheating hotel operators. But what could they do? Arguing with the Romans wasn't an option. So they donned their caps, packed up, and went. They began the slow walk to Bethlehem, filled with curiosity, perhaps a touch of anxiety, if not outright fear, and a longing to find the truth at the end of the journey. It was a mix of emotions, but at the center of it all, but at the center of it all was anticipation. It was the first advent. About the same time all this was happening, there was an alignment of the star with two planets that led some wise people to decide to travel to Judea because they believed a new king would be born there. Following the advice of an angel, shepherds show up to see this new baby. They loaded up their camels with what they needed, plus some gifts for the new king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. At a stopover in Jerusalem, they chatted with a king named Harad. He was not a good guy. Harad was downright evil. The thought of another king made him mad. So mad that he hatched an evil plan. A terrible idea, but he pretends to also want to meet this king and ask those wise people to come back and let him know where the king is. There was no phone, no internet, no way to make reservations for the inn. So poor Mary and Joseph arrived to find out there was no place for them to stay other than a stable. If you've ever been on a farm or gone horseback riding, you can imagine that this was far from desirable. When they entered the stable, they found it empty except for one pig. This might not be so bad after all, but then the birth.
Mary starts having contractions, Joseph looks around the stable. <laughs> Celestial bodies line up again. Following the advice of an angel, shepherds show up to see this new baby. There sure are a lot of people trusting random angel appearances. I guess they all had some serious trust in God and that all his messages were true. When they get there, Mary tells them that her son is born for all mankind. Magi arrives shortly thereafter. Mary is exhausted by all these visitors, and she, Joseph, and the baby sleep. Guess who appears to Joseph? You got it, another angel. This one warns them that Jesus is in danger due to that evil King Herod. He wakes Mary and a family of three heads out to Egypt. Their roadmap to Bethlehem and, the, and then to Egypt wasn't clear. Neither is the roadmap we follow through life. The end, or is it? Did you notice the theology that was happening there all over the place? Nothing ever goes quite as we plan. I know that there are some children out here, so right this moment I'm going to talk to the parents. Babies change things. They change our schedules, they change our sleep patterns, they change our chore list. They change our levels of patience and tolerance. They change our concerns and our anxiety or our anxieties. And along with all of this, the sleep deprivation, 
for one or both parents, keeping the family safe and together. All these things come differently and frequently, more frequently than they ever came before. Babies change things. Our social lives, our interests, our financial realities. And looking back on it and experiencing it even now, these changes help us all to grow. Babies change things. They help us share. They help us learn to share literally our bodies, our time, and our stuff. And Mary and Joseph faced all of these challenges and many more as we do with help from God above and help from angels on earth and in heaven. So what did the baby Jesus arrive? 2,000 plus years later, we're still celebrating that birthday. We're celebrating our hopes for healing and for wholeness. We're celebrating our faith. We're sharing our hope even in an unsteady future. And we're still growing as parents do in love. Babies change everything. Here in the reading of the word of the Lord. Beloved, our hymn is number 134.
So we lift up the 800,000 or so people who've been infected in this horrible pandemic. We lift up those who are sick and we especially lift up Ben. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy Father and loving God, we know that you do indeed change things. Things that we can see and things that we can't. Today we lift up all those who are ill, all those who are struggling to prevent the illness, and all those everywhere who are struggling to prevent further illness. Holy God, we are working hard. We're working hard on your behalf. We're working hard on our family's behalf, and we're working hard on our own behalf. Help us, please, Lord as we work. Help us, Lord, when we have too much work. And help us, Lord, when there isn't enough work. Holy God, we lift up ourselves, those we love, and strangers we only hear about in the news folks in the path of destruction. Lord God, we ask together that you heal us and help us change ourselves in that healing, that not only we ourselves and our communities might be healed, but that the earth might be healed and that we all are aligned in you. Help us to pray as your Son came to teach us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, we often think of offerings as only financial, but there's so much more. The young people today sharing their thespian skills and their musical skills and all of everybody's time. I gave 10 announcements early this morning, and that's a lot of time and energy. Time and energy is at a premium in our world. We must decide when to rest in winter and when to work in harvest. So I invite you to consider your time and your talents and to figure out how best to use them for the kingdom of heaven on earth. I offer that invitation with prayer and thanks. Would you rise and join me in singing the doxological hymn number 606?
just uh, make my heart as stable again. We're going to keep doing that until Christmas Eve, but today we're going to sing Love. Okay?